Thank you for joining our broadcast today at City Life Church. We would love to hear how God is using this ministry to change your life. So please take a moment to send us your story at info at citylifechurch.cc. And if God has used this ministry to touch you in any way, we want to encourage you to partner with us financially to help us to bring God's word to other people. You can go to our website at citylifechurch.cc to find the giving options that work best for you. We've got an encouraging word for you, and we pray that you lean in and engage as we head into the auditorium for today's message. But um, we went off to Orlando, and uh, they took us to Disney World. What better place to go and to act like a kid and to dream than to go to Disney World? And of course, poor Pastor Tony, he had to um, hang back at the hotel because he just didn't have the energy. But we just had such an amazing time. And, and I came to the realization of something while I was on this trip this past weekend. And it all happened in a moment in a hallway at a hotel room because um, it was Friday night after um, Disney World. And we had went to Pastor Tony and Pastor Casey's uh, hotel room to have some donuts and coffee. Because how many of you know coffee is something good at like 10 o'clock at night, you know? <laughs> And uh, especially with them hot Krispy Kreme donuts, too. The anointing was all over that place, okay? And uh, we were in there. We were sharing. We were laughing. We were just having a good time. And um, uh, we decided that, uh, uh, well, actually, Pastor decided that enough was enough. It was time for us all to go to our rooms. And so we, we walked into the hallway. And this hotel was massive. And this hallway was as long as the eye could see. I'm not even making this up. Like when you look down this hallway, it looked like it went for miles. And Pastor Justin looked over at us and said, let's have a race down to the end of the hallway. <laughs> and me being the voice of reason, I said, we are not racing down this hallway. And then Pastor Matt, our new children's pastor, he goes, no, 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 I'm in. I'm in, let's do this. And then about that time, I heard the voice of my wife from behind me Say, y'all ready? Go! I took off running. Listen, I said I was trying to be the voice of reason, but I wasn't going to be left out of this moment, okay? We start running down this hallway at like 11 o'clock at night, and Pastor Matt tries to cheat. And how many of you know that Jesus always gets the cheaters, all right? He tried cheating. He tried pushing us up against the wall where Jesus just took his legs out from underneath him. He goes flying like Superman into the air and he's bouncing on the ground like he's trying to slide into home base. And he hits Pastor Justin. Pastor Justin goes flipping in the air, lands on the ground, rolls twice, and then there's the voice of the reason still trucking it down the hallway. I said, I self-declare myself the winner right now in the name of Jesus. And I said, if it was for style, Pastor Matt, you would have won. I said, if it was for length, Pastor Justin, you would have won. But we all know who the real winner was tonight. The one who Jesus had his hand upon. But it was in that moment, I got lost for a second. It was in that moment that I realized that I'm a part of one of the uh, best pastoral teams that has ever been put together. And I love doing life with them. I love serving with them. I would go to battle with them every single day. And so for all of you pastors in this room, all of you staff that are in this room and outside of this room, I honor you. I love you. I serve with you. I go to battle with you every single day. To all of the wives that are just lined up here today on the, on the front row, we love you all. Thank you all so much for standing with us, walking with us, uh, and uh, speaking and being the voice of reason and saying go at times when we don't want to go. But how many of you know that this staff would not be who we are and would not be together and would not be doing the amazing things that we are without our head pastors, Pastor Tony and Pastor Casey Stewart. So we love you. Thank you so much. Oh, come on. Y'all can do a little bit better than that. Man, they took us to Disney World, y'all. And so anyways, that Friday night when I got back to my room after feeling really good about winning, I uh, sat in the bed and my wife was getting ready for bed and I just felt the Lord drop the scripture in my spirit and I started typing on my phone because I left my computer and my iPad at home and I, I just began to type on my phone and she said, what are you doing? I said, I don't know. The Lord just dropped this scripture in my spirit. And so I started writing some stuff down and putting some thoughts together and lo and behold, I'm standing before you today. And so I don't believe that this is an accident in any way. And this is a scripture that I've read um, before, and it's in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there today. 
And this is one of my favorite scriptures. And I say that a, a lot about scriptures that I read. And, and um, uh, if you don't have a favorite column for scriptures, you need to get one. And, and this is definitely one that is, is in my favorite column scriptures. And I want to share with you today for just a few moments. And in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12, if you don't have your Bible, you can look on the screen behind me, or if you're worshiping with us, church online, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, don't log off. God's got something good for you. And um, you can just read right there on the screen if you don't have a Bible in your office or your car, or wherever you're at. If you're driving, don't read though. Just listen. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12, it says this, therefore, lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. Lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather healed. I love that right, right there. So that what is lame may not be put out of joint. In other words, put down to the pasture, given up on, quit on, but instead of those areas, that those areas would be healed. Today, for just the next few moments, I want to talk to you on this subject, how to survive a bad day. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you so much for today. God, I thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to be used by you. And so, Father, I just pray, God, that as we go through your word together, God, that our lives would be changed, our hearts would be changed, and that we would leave this place changed. Father, we love you and we thank you. In your name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. You ever had a bad day before? You know, like a bad day. I heard somebody say, oh, I'm having one right now. You ever just had a bad day? Like I've had bad days. Like I've had a bad day and then I've had a bad day. Anybody you've had a bad day? You know, like one of those that just keeps coming up day after day after day. And the more you think about it, the more upset you get. Like I had one of those, one of those days. You know, I, 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 this day that I had this one time, it's gotta be probably the worst one because it's one of those moments in my life that I was probably the worst in life at that moment, like I am not who my family needed in that moment, you know, and it was just a bad day. But I remember we had just bought our first house, me and my wife, we had just bought our first house. This was like three years ago and, and, and we moved in, we loved it. My wife made me paint the entire thing before we moved in because it, it had to fit her, you know? And, and I remember when, when, when we looked at this house, we knew it was the house for us the moment we walked in the backyard because the grass was, I mean, it was brand new. It was thick. It was lush. I love grass. Okay. And, and I love mowing grass. It's when I pray. It's when I put my messages together. I just get my non self propelled mower out and I go to town <laughs> on my yard and it had a pool and these nice pavers and this really nice fire pit. And, and, and we just knew the moment we walked in that this was our house. And so Fast forward like three months later, we had some friends that come down from Tennessee to spend, th uh, not Thanksgiving, but um, uh, Fourth of July with us, different, wrong uh, holiday. But they came to spend the Fourth of July with us. And I remember me and my friend were in the backyard and, and, and we were just laughing, having a good time. And he said, hey, we need to have a fire. And I had a ton of brush in, in my fire pit and it had been raining. And I said, yeah, let's try and start this fire, but I don't know because it's been raining, it's really wet. And he said, ah, oh, man, I'm from Tennessee. I can do this. And I said, all right. So I give him the lighter. He starts lighting it. We get like this little bitty flame about that big and it doesn't grow anymore. And he looks at me and he says, do you have anything to help this fire grow? And I said, yeah, I got a can of gas in the garage. <laughs> so him being the voice of reason in that moment, he said, go get it. That'll work. And so I run into the garage and I forgot that it's not just gasoline, but this is a metal can that you buy from the store that is uh, pre-mixed gas. So half of it's gas and half of it's oil. And so I go over there and as I proceed to dump this gas into the fire, I take a step back and go, no, nah, this ain't right. And he said, no, do it. And I'm like, no, I can't. I feel like something bad's going to happen. He said, well, give me the can. I'm from Tennessee. I can do this. So I give him the can and he proceeds to pour this gas onto the fire, this little bitty flame, and it's just putting the flame out. He looks over at me as he's dumping gas in and he says, what's in this can, water? And about that time, the little bitty flame just shot all the way up the stream and caught the can on fire that he was holding. And that's when everything went wrong. 
Because in that moment, we both freak out. He starts running around my yard screaming, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? With this can of gas in his hand that is now shooting out fire. And I'm like, put it down, it's gonna explode. It's gonna blow you up, put it down, it's gonna explode in your hand. So he puts it down with nothing around it and we take a step back and apparently where he put it, where there was nothing around, that wasn't a very safe place to put it. Because he proceeds to go back and pick the can back up and start running around my yard again, screaming, what do I do with this can of fire? And I told him, I said, you better throw the can, it's gonna explode in your hand. And he looks at my grass and he cocks back like that. And I just looked at him and said, if you do, you're dead. <laughs> and I said, you worried about that fire killing you? I will kill you if you catch my grass on fire. And so he turns around and he chucks it across my pavers into the pool. And when he does, this fire just leaves this, this, this line of gas all the way from where he threw it all the way to my pool. Now there's this wall of fire on my pavers, taller than I am. And, and just listen, it was tall, okay? Because it was really tall, all right? It's just this wall of fire. It lands in the pool. All the gas goes out in the pool. Now my entire pool is on fire. My wife had just bought $200 worth of inflatables and they're all just going down. And I look at Jason and I said, you better do something right now because if my wife sees this, we're dead. We're dead. This is bad. The fire is growing in the pool. It's starting to singe my, 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 my palm tree. And I just knew we were going to burn our house down. Only been in it three months and I run over to grab the water hose and, and I had this 10 foot water hose hooked up to it. So when I went to run, it literally jerked me back. I land on my back. My friend's running around like, what do I do? What do I do? And next thing I know, I hear this splash in the water. My friend jumped in the water that was on fire to try and save the inflatables. <laughs> That's not even the worst. My wife comes outside. We're running around and she looks at the two of us and she said, what in the world are you two doing? She said, the pool's on fire. I said, I know it's on fire. We're trying to get it not to be on fire. And she said, it's contained in the pool. Chill out. I was like, wait, what? She's like, it can't go any further than what the pool goes. She said, the house is fine. She said, calm down, get Jason out of the pool. And then she proceeds to walk back into the house and then she turns around and she looked at me and she said, but you just burnt up your baby girl's little shark. So there better be a brand new shark in this pool tomorrow before she wakes up or you're in trouble, mister. And I looked at Jason and I said, we gotta go to Walmart right now, right now. But here's the crazy thing about this whole story because that's a bad day, especially when your wife comes out with fire in her eyes, it's a bad day. But here's what I learned about in that moment that even in the chaos that I had created, that even in the moment that I thought was completely uh, uh, out of control and the fire was shooting up and my palm tree was getting singed, that besides the burnt ends of the palm tree, that when everything was said and done and settled, you couldn't even tell that me and my friend had caught my pool on fire. You see, even the line a fire that went from one side of the pavers to the other, all the way to the pool. There was not one shred of evidence that the pool in that spot was ever on fire. There was no charred, there was nothing. The only thing that there was was the pavers was a little warm from the heat of the fire. And you see, I think a lot of times in our lives, we have things that happen to us or we get in these arguments with somebody and, and because of our overreaction, it causes us to think that the situation is so much more worse than what it really is. And that because of our overreaction, now we don't speak to that person anymore. Now we've allowed that to affect our lives in some way. Now we've stopped walking in our purpose because of something that someone said or because of something that someone did to me. And let me just tell you right now, nobody has the authority to affect your life or your future unless you give them permission to. That doesn't matter who it is. If you don't give them permission to, to affect your life, 
They have no power over you because what somebody else says does not trump what Jesus says about you. But we have these moments, these bad times, these bad days, and we think to ourselves, man, this is it. It's over. It's done. We overreact. We overreact of, of, you know, because of what the dog did, or we overreact because of what our husband said, or, or we overreact because of what our wife said. And, and before long, we just allow ourselves to get in these situations that if we would just take a step back, maybe even pray, that God would begin to reveal to us that, yeah, you may have gotten into an argument, but look, there's really no damage done. That look, what you just walked through right now, yeah, I was a little tough, but look what happened when you gave it to me. There was really no damage done. You really can't tell. I mean, there was a few things that may have gotten singed in your life, but in the long run, you're still as healthy as you've ever been. You're still living, you're still kicking. And I think a lot of times we can look at 2020 and we can think, man, this year has been bad. And it has been difficult. And for some of us, it's been terrible. But for a lot of us, we're still here. We're still moving, we're still going. Things may be a little bit different than it was at the beginning of the year, but just because we have a bad moment doesn't mean we now have a bad life but that God never called us into something unless he was willing to take us out of it. And so today I want to encourage you, stop declaring that 2020 has been a year of terrible, terrible, terrible-ism. I don't even know if that's a word or not. But just know that God's bringing us through it. That we need to begin to lift up our drooping hands and strengthen our weak knees because there's areas in our lives that we think are dead, but God wants to bring healing to them. That we have to go through things at times to grow. We have to go through things at times to get to that level that God wants us to be at. That sometimes we have to go through strife in order to grow closer. That if you're married in here, don't despise the fights that you have with your spouse. Because it's those fights that you have that begins to draw you even closer. And some of you are like, nah, you don't know the fights that we've had. Well, maybe it's because Jesus isn't in the center of your relationship, but that if Jesus is the center of your life, there's nothing that he can't help you get through. I got to hurry. James chapter one, verse two says this, because a lot of times we can look around and say, God, why would you let us go through these things? But it says this, consider it great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, whenever you go through a bad day. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. You see, we have to go through things. We have to go through bad days at times because God never said that when we gave our life to him that everything was going to be sunshine and flowers. But there are going to be days that we have to walk through that are going to be tougher than the day before. But that if Jesus is our center, we will always get through it. So how do we begin to do that in a practical way? Well, I'm glad you asked. The first thing is this. That in a practical way to begin to get over those bad days that you have in your life that hasn't just been a bad day, but it's turned into a bad month and a bad year and a bad relationship. It's simple. Forgive everyone who's trying to ruin your life. Forgive everyone that is trying to ruin your life. And you may be sitting there thinking, man, that sounds very dramatic. Well, I'm a pretty dramatic person. (laughs) But how many of you know, when we get into a fight with somebody, that's how we act. Oh my gosh, they ruined our life. But listen to what Ephesians chapter four, verse 31 says, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. You see, I think a lot of times we forget that we needed forgiveness in our lives as well. You see, I think at times we forget that we needed grace and we needed mercy and we need somebody to go the extra mile to love us just a little bit more one day. But we're not willing to give that same grace. We're not willing to give that same mercy And that same forgiveness and God's saying, you need to get rid of the bitterness that you've been holding in your life because it's holding you back from the purpose that I've called for you. Stop 
or you need to forgive those that are trying to ruin your life. The second thing is this, help others who are experiencing the same struggles that you are. Because you see, you're not the only one to walk through this. You're not the only one to go through that struggle. You're not the only one to have that pain. But that there are other people in this world and in your life that are walking through some of the same things that you are. And if you would be willing to open yourself up and say, you know what, I'm walking through the same thing that you're walking. Let's walk this out together. You see, Galatians chapter six, verse two says, carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. In other words, Christ created us to walk together and to help each other out. That we were never meant to walk out life and to do life alone, but that we are to carry one another's burdens. We are to help others who are experiencing the same struggles that we are. Aim your hard questions at God and not man. Aim your, that's a hard one right there. Because we want to run to our best friend that always agrees with everything that we have to say. And really not say, but complain about. Well, they said this and they're terrible. You're right, they are terrible. You never get healing from those that are just going to agree with everything that you say. But we need to begin to take our problems to God and our questions to God and not to man, that we will always be stuck in the same rut day after day after day, going over the same thing, struggling with the same, de dealing with the same person until we stop taking it to our neighbor who probably gossips about us and begin to take it to God. Because when we begin to release it out of our hands into God's hands, it's incredible the things that he begins to do. You see, when we release it, it's no longer our responsibility. When we release the hurt that someone else has caused in our lives, it's no longer our responsibility, but it's God's re responsibility. And so I encourage you today, release the pain, release the hurt, release the frustrations. First Peter 5, 7 says, cast your cares on him because he cares. We serve a God who loves us enough that even the smallest problem in our life he cares about. So begin to release it to him. Number four is be assured that there is a purpose, but there's also an end. That there is a purpose to everything that we walk through, but there's also an end to it. That there is a purpose for the year 2020, but I'm here to prophesy to you there is an end to 2020 and it's coming in less than eight weeks. You see, it reminds me of this time that I was driving out to Waiamama to, for a meeting for youth camp. And, and as I was driving, you ever been driving and you just get lost in your thoughts, you know, and then you get to where you were going and you're like, how did I get here? And you're like, did I run anybody over? You know, it was one of those days because it was like beautiful outside. The sun was shining and the birds were chirping and I had the sunroof open on my car and I was just driving down the highway, just enjoying the day. And and, and I happened to look over out the, my window and I noticed that there was this rainbow just, just out there in the middle of, of the clear blue skies. And I thought to myself, wow, that's odd because usually the rainbow happens after a storm. Like usually that's a sign that there was a storm that had passed through. And so I'm looking at this rainbow and then I noticed that all the cars that are coming at me, they all have their lights on, they all have their windshield wipers on and and they're just, they're soaked. And it wasn't until I began to look far off into the distance that I noticed that there was a storm that I was heading into. And I began to think, wow, and God began to speak to me in that moment. And he said, I just wanted to show you and remind you that I already promised to bring you through the storm before you ever got into it. And I just want to encourage somebody in here this morning that maybe you're going through a storm right now that you don't feel like there's an end to it. Well, I want to tell you that there's a purpose for you going through that storm, but God has already promised you that he's going to bring you through it. So just keep the faith, keep holding on because we serve a God who is faithful in our lives. He's going to bring you through it. Somebody just shout at your neighbor if you came with him today and say, he's going to bring you through. If you didn't come with him, don't say nothing to him. <laughs> the fifth thing, fifth thing is this, surrender your day to God and let it go. Surrender your day to God and let it go. 
Stop giving it to him and then taking it back. But surrender it to him. You see, my Bible says that this battle I don't have to fight because God fights it for me. So why would I continue to carry something around day after day after day that I have no business carrying around? You just need to begin to give it to God and let it go. Some of you, you need to give God your marriage and you just need to take your hands off of it and say, God, you begin to do the work because everything that I'm doing, God, it's not working. God, it's not working. God, the ministry that I feel like you've told me, God, and that I know that I have inside of me, God, I'm taking my hands off of it. I'm giving it to you because God, you are the one that is in full control. Lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees so that what is lame may not be put out, but rather heal. You see, the writer of Hebrews, he's, he's addressing a church that has been going through some bad days in their life. He's addressing a church that has been struggling with persecution for their faith that they have in Jesus so much so that they're being martyred and killed for their faith and their love in Jesus and that they are now getting tired. They are now getting weak and they're now questioning themselves. Is this even worth going after? Is Jesus somebody even worth the trouble? And so he begins to tell them, lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. You see in the Bible, every time it refers to hands, it's referring to strength. And that every time it's referring to knees, it's referring to energy or activity. And so the writer is telling the church, listen, you've lost your strength. You've lost your energy, your productivity, what God has called you to do, your purpose, you're no longer doing anymore. And he's telling them, lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. You see, as I sat in the bed in that hotel on Friday night and I began to think about over this scripture, I began to think about the church now, how so many of us are going through fear. We're struggling with the what if. We're dealing with things in our lives that maybe we didn't cause. We're hiding in our homes because of a pandemic. And that some could look at the church and think you're losing your strength. Where's your energy? Where's your productivity? Where's your purpose? You see, the, I find that the more I'm away from something, the more I begin to lose sight of it. And that there's some of you out there today, in person and worshiping online, you've begun to lose sight of God You've begun to lose sight of your purpose. You've begun to lose sight of what God is calling you to do and has given you the power to do. And today, Jesus is saying, lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. Because what is lame, which for some of us, it's us, is reminding you that it's not over for you. It's not done that we need to begin to make straight the path for our feet because God wants to heal us. God wants to free us from fear. God wants to free us from our struggles. God wants to free us from our pain. God wants to free us from those things that we have been battling with, with relationships, with things that people have said about us. And he's saying, lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. You see, I love how he starts Hebrews chapter 12 because he begins to remind us that we are not the only ones to have walked through something like this, that we are not the only ones that somebody has ever said anything mean about, that we are not the only ones that for some of us have lost our job during this pandemic or during this pandemic has, has shown some rocky places in our marriage and in our relationships. And now we find ourselves struggling and he begins to remind them that there have been others that have come before us and that have walked through this and that have gotten through it. And he goes on to say in Hebrews chapter 12, verse one, do you see what this means? All these pioneers who have blazed 
the way. All these veterans cheering us on. It means we better get on with it, strip down, start running, and never quit. You see, somebody, you need to go home today, look at yourself in the mirror and say, you know what, everything that I've been walking through, don't ever quit. Don't ever quit. Because what God has brought you from has been a miracle. And it's been too big for you to just give up on now and go back to the same old life, the same old rut. But God's saying what you're going through right now, you're going to get through it. Why? Because I've already promised it. I've given you a sign to remember what I've done in your life. Don't give up. Don't quit. Never quit. Somebody shout that. Never quit. Never quit. He goes on to say, no spiritual fat, no parasitic sins. Keep your eyes on Jesus. You see, that's a big one right there. Because when something comes at us, we don't tend to go like this. We tend to go like this. And it's hard to see what God's doing in front of us when all we're doing is looking down at our own feet. Because I think a lot of times our our ground has been so rocky and so shaken by what we're walking through that we're just trying to watch our feet to make sure that we don't make a misstep and fall. When God's saying, if you would just keep your eyes on me, the anchor of your life, I would see you through anything. That I'll begin to sure up your path. That if you just keep your eyes on me, and you see some of you, you've lost focus of God. You've taken your eyes off of him and put it on your problem. Just like Peter did when he said, Jesus, if it's you, call me to come out. And what happened? He began to take his eyes off of Jesus as he's walking on water. And when he lost focus of where his power came from, he began to sink on his own ability. And some of us were sinking today because we're relying on our own ability and we've lost focus of the power of God working in our lives. Keep your eyes on Jesus. It says, who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how Jesus did it because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God, he could put up with anything along the way, the cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor, right alongside God. When you find yourself lacking in your faith, go over that story again and again, item by item, that long litany of hostility that Jesus plowed through that will shoot adrenaline into your soul. You see, when you are reminded of what God has already done for you yesterday, then you'll be reminded that the power that it took him to get you through that is the same power that it's going to take to get you through whatever it is that you're facing today. Never quit. Don't take your eyes off of Jesus and remember what he's already done for you as you stand to your feet. This morning, as I talk about this today, as I think about this scripture, lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. Find your purpose. Find the one who gives you strength. See, as I begin to think about the scripture, it begins to remind me of the testimonies that have come from this house. It reminds me of the father that is here who serves every single week that was a crack addict and for years and years and years would always be in and out of rehabs because he just couldn't kick the habit that he lost his family he lost his wife he lost his children and then one day he walked into city life and said i'm going to give it one more chance now god did something in his life that day and he decided on that day, I'm not giving up. He decided that on that day that I'm going to get my eyes back on Jesus because I remember what he's done for me in the past. And I know that he can get me through this. He checked himself into rehab. He got his life straightened up. He is now saved, serving here every single week. And that God has begun to restore everything that he lost. 
that his family has come back. His brothers and his sisters came back. And he just came to me two weeks ago and said, Pastor EJ, my daughter, who I have not talked to in 23 years, she's coming to see me in December. And she's bringing my granddaughter that I've never met before. You see, when you're reminded of what God can do in your life, God just doesn't want to get you out of the problem that you're in, but he wants to begin to restore everything back to you that the enemy took from you. And today, I don't know where you're at. I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know what you're struggling with. But I can tell you this, that I serve a God who is faithful. I serve a God who is real. I serve a God who is bigger than a pandemic. I serve a God who is bigger than any argument. And that whatever you need in your life, he can do it. I'm reminded of the stories of those that have lost their jobs before the pandemic and during the pandemic and how God has now restored back to them everything that they've lost because they remember just because I'm walking through something doesn't mean that I'm stuck in it because the God that delivered me yesterday is the same God that can deliver me today. So what are you walking through? What are you dealing with? What are you carrying that you need to release into God's hands? Today's your opportunity to release it. Today's your opportunity to let it go. Today's your opportunity to say, God, you know what? The way that I reacted in this moment wasn't right. Forgive me. And then some of you need to go home and to call or to go to someone's house and ask them to forgive you. And so today, whatever it is, they're going to come and they're going to worship for just a few moments. Nobody leave because we're going to come back and we're going to begin to pray. But as they begin to sing over you, I just want you to begin to identify everything that today you need to release. Those things that are keeping your hands from raising and that is taking the productivity and the energy out of your legs and out of your knees that's stealing your purpose, stealing your joy. As they begin to sing over you today, I just want you to begin to identify those, to begin to place them in your hands and say, God, today, they're yours. Today, I'm walking out of this place free. Today, I'm walking out of this place empty-handed because everything that I've been trying to do in my life, God, today, it's your responsibility. Thank you again for joining us for today's broadcast. Our prayer is that it ministered to you and it changed your life. If there's anything we can pray with you about or God has used this ministry to touch you in any way, please send us an email to info at citylifechurch.cc. We want to invite you to be our guest at one of our Sunday or Wednesday worship experiences. And you can find our times and locations on our website at citylifechurch.cc. You can also download our City Life Church app on your smartphones or tablets for more online messages. It was great having you with us today, and we'll see you next time.